Good afternoon. I'm Marie, a second year grad student of UCSC. We've come to the seventh and eighth in a series of programs with Quasars Program Quasars. My advisor is Xavier Prochaska. In addition to X and I, there is also Joe Hanari in MPIA working on this QPQ survey. First, we have to define what's the circumgalactic medium. It's a diffuse gas, of ha gas halo surrounding a galaxy. There are also metals and dust in it. Its temperature is typically 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 kelvins. The CGM extends from tens of kiloparsecs to 300 kiloparsecs. And beyond that, we usually regard that as the IGM, but there isn't really a clear boundary between the CGM and the IGM. Star formation in galaxies requires continuous supply of fuel, and this fuel is accreted from the CGM. And in turn, the CGM has physical properties driven by star formation feedback. Here I'm showing the results of Fumagalli et al. 2011. It's a simulated Redshift 3 massive galaxy. Um, they used an inductive mesh refinement code called ART, and then they post-processed this galaxy with radiative transfer. The code included extragalactic UV background and local sources of UV radiation. This is an H1 density map. We see the cold gases feeding into the galaxy in the form of filaments. Most of the gas streams is ionized, but the NH1 is still as high as 10 to the 17. In, observ in observation, th these gas streams will appear as optically thick absorbers. The CGM is usually too diffuse to be studied in emission, so we have to study it in absorption, but even that isn't very straightforward, because on average, a random sightline will intercept less than one massive halo. That's why we embarked this QPQ survey. Thanks to Sloan, we have a catalog of a million quasars. If we assume the two-point correlation function takes a power law form, here our naught is the clustering amplitude. Quasars at Redshift 2 have a clustering amplitude of around 8 megaparsecs. And White et al. 2011 computed that this clustering strength implies a dark matter halo mass of 10 to the 12.5 solar masses. These quasar host galaxies are predicted to evolve into present day massive galaxies. Quasars are bright and easy to find, so they're good, and they tag massive galaxies in the sky. The cartoon here illustrates what QPQ means. This is our experimental setup. The foreground quasar, these are the cold clumps of gas inside, cold cl clumps of cold gas inside the foreground quasar's halo. Um, the foreground quasar's illumination on the gas notes the opening angle of this radiation is less than 4 pi star radians. This is our line of sight to the foreground quasar. Our line of sight to the background quasar, which intercepts the foreground quasar's halo at an impact parameter LPERP. From the Sloan Quasar Catalog, we select candidates of closely projected quasar pairs, and then we confirm them with follow-up spectroscopy. To date, our QPQ survey has found 700 pairs to within one mega separation one megaparsec separation, and we recorded the observation journal in QBQ6. The previous work has focused primarily on H1, and here's a summary of QBQ126. These are stack spectra of background quasars at different impact parameter bins. X axis is relative velocity relative to the foreground quasar's redshift. Y-axis is flux normalized to the quasar's continuum. For each composite spectrum, there is a Gaussian best fit overplotted on it. First, we look at the innermost bin. There is strong Lyman alpha absorption. The second innermost bin, there is still strong Lyman alpha absorption. The next bin in LPERP, the Lyman alpha absorption is weaker, but it's not negligible. In the outermost bin, 
500 kiloparsecs to 1 megaparsec, the Lyman alpha absorption is still there. Clearly, along our line of sight to a quasar, the Lyman alpha opacity has to be suppressed as we don't see absorptions by its own gaseous halo, which is known as a proximity effect. But in the transverse direction, we found excess absorption up to 1 megaparsec. As we don't see the transverse proximity effects, this suggests the quasar does not illuminate on the gas in the transverse direction. Here are some maps of the CGM in H1 Lyman alpha equivalent widths. I want to emphasize they are representations of real data, not simulations. Cos halos, cos dwarfs, Lyman brick galaxies, and finally our QPQ sample, which are massive redshift 2 galaxies hosting quasars. The inner and outer edges are defined by the data coverage, and they are not physical edges. To generate these maps, we measure the covering fractions of strong absorbers at different annuli of LPERP. The covering fraction is the average number of absorbers that our line of sight will intercept at a given LPERP. We randomly distributed these absorbers at each annulus of LPERP. Compared with other galaxy populations, we see that the QBQ population shows a much higher incidence of strong Lyman alpha absorption. None of the existing simulations is able to reproduce this high covering fraction of nearly unity. And just for comparison, I want to show you the CGM in an emission. This is Sebastiano's jackpot nebula. This is a Lyman alpha surface brightness map. It's called jackpot because one, two, three, four. Now, come to QPQ7. This is a plot of carbon to 1334 equivalent width versus LPERP, and this is a plot of carbon 4, 1548 versus LPERP. The black squares mark three sigma detections. The open squares are non detections at their two sigma values, and the blue symbols are average equivalent widths in bins of LPERP. Both the 1334 and 1548 transitions show large equivalent widths, typically at one angstrom. For carbon-2, we found strong absorptions at LPERP less than 200 kiloparsec, beyond which the absorption is weaker. And for carbon-4, we see excess absorption up to 1 megaparsec. Both distributions anti-correlate with LPERP, and carbon-2's evolution with LPERP is stronger than carbon-4's evolution with LPERP. We conclude that the redshift 2 quasars are enveloped in highly enriched cold CGM. These are equivalent width maps of carbon-2-1334 in absorption. Again, we see a much higher incidence of carbon-2, strong carbon-2 absorption in the QPQ population. So we conclude that the QBQ population marks the pinnacle in cool and enriched CGM. Because the, the proximity effect is absent in the transverse direction, we speculate that quasar feedback is un unlikely to be the main driver of this cool and highly enriched CGM. And we note that these quasar host galaxies live in more massive halos than their coeval Lyman break galaxies as redshift 2, we speculate the cool CGM may be driven by halo mass predominantly. Using lower dispersion data in QBQ127, we measured the covering fraction and equivalent widths of Lyman alpha and other metal transition lines. But to construct a detailed model for the physical state of the CGM, we need higher dispersion data, and this motivated QPQ8. We require closely projected quasar pairs separated by less than 300 physical kiloparsec at the foreground quasar's redshift. We want the background quasar and the foreground quasar to be physically unassociated which means they have to be separated by at least 4,000 4, kilometers per second in velocity space. Before QBQ8, we already got a pair studied in detail, and that's QBQ3. 
it became the prototype of QPQ8. This is a slow image of the QPQ3 quasar pair, but we don't know if that's typical of redshift 2 massive galaxies. That's why we must study more pairs and form a statistical sample. We mined through our QBQ survey data and found 11 spectra that match all of our sample selection criteria listed here. I want to use the 1420 plus 1603 system as an example. We search in a plus minus 2,000 kilometers per second velocity window around the foregone quasar's redshift for absorption lines. These plots are velocity profiles of some major ion transitions. The black line is normalized flux, and the orange line here marks unrelated absorptions at redshifts not associated with a foreground quasar. We see multiple ionization states of the same element, for example, carbon-2, carbon-4, they're both strong and saturated, and there are silicon-2 and silicon-4, but not the absence of N5. We look at the transitions outside the Lyman Alpha forest and found that the absorption profiles follow the same shape, and they can be further divided into six subsystems. Now I want to introduce the delta V90 statistic. It's the velocity interval enclosing 90% of optical depth of a given absorption line. This is a plot of carbon-4 delta V90 statistic and carbon-2 delta, delta V90 statistic. Carbon-4 is always detected, and when carbon-2 is detected, the velocity width is similar to carbon-4. These are impressive kinematics. For comparison, the peak circular velocity of a 10 to the 12.5 solar mass dark matter halo is just 300 kilometers per second. A few of these systems have velocity width much higher than this. And also we found the velocity width of the QBQ systems is systematically larger than that of other galaxy populations, for example, the DLA host galaxies. As we've seen the metal ion absorption show multiple components, we assume that the H1 also has multiple components traced by the redshifts of these ions. There's a diverse NH1 measurement precision. In one case, we saw damping wings, so we are confident that the NH1 has to be larger than 20.1. And some systems, we got coverage of the full Lyman transition. And for such a case, we can have tighter constraints on the total NH1 and the Doppler B parameter. But for some other systems, we only have Lyman alpha, and the uncertainty in modeling NH1 may be larger. We obtained chi-square best fit solution with the code Alice. It employs the MP fit package to do void profile modeling. This is a summary plot of NH1 versus R perp of the different systems, and a plot of NC2 and carbon 2 versus R perp. From the distribution of H1 and carbon 2, we see that the surface density of low ions decreases with Alperp. And from this plot of NH1 versus Alperp, we can estimate the total mass of H1 in the CGM. Within the virial radius, 160 kiloparsec, we found the total H1 mass to be 2 times 10 to the 9 solar masses. Current 2 also show large equivalent uh, show large column density values, which means the metal mass is also substantial. We also performed photoionization modeling to infer additional physical properties using Cloudy. I wouldn't go over the details here, but just want to tell you that the main output of the Cloudy model is the ionization parameter U, which is the flux of ionizing photons divided by the volume density divided by C. We found that the U value is much smaller than that expected if the quasar's radiation is isotropic, which means the quasar doesn't shine on the gas. 
We've seen this plot before, NH1 decreases with L perp. This is a plot of U versus L perp. There's a clear increasing trend. The evolution of U with L perp is contrary to our ex expectation if the quasar radiation dominates illumination on a gas. Because this ionization parameter U is primarily dominated uh, determined by high ion to low ion ratios, not NH1, it's remarkable that we actually see a correlation between U and NH1. And this implies that the volume density increases with, uh, decreases with l -perp. With Cloudy's ionization corrections, we can calculate the total NH and the metallicity. But I want to emphasize there are large error propagations from various sources, such as NH1 measurements, ionization parameter modeling, and the cloudy assumptions. Using the median NH value 19.6, we found that within the via radius, the total mass of the cool phase CGM is three times 10 to 10 solar masses. And the metallicity is typically one tenth solar, and sometimes it can approach solar. This is the summary slide and some speculations. Um, the CGM of massive redshift 2 galaxies represents a pinnacle of cool and highly enriched halo gas. They are progenitors of present-day massive galaxies. And we speculate that quasars are unlikely the main driver. We saw substantial kinematics traced by both low and high ions, which is much larger than 300 km kilometers per second, the typical peak circular velocity. And if we ask the question whether the gas is outflow or cold accretion, we encounter more problems because both scenarios are problematic. And if you want to know more about that, come talk to me. Um, here are some numbers that will provide new clues to galaxy formation models. The total mass of H1 within the real radius is 2 times 10, 10, 2 times 10 to the 9 solar masses. And the total mass of a cool phase CGM is 3 times 10 to the 10 solar masses. Metallicity is typically 1 tenth solar. And finally, because U increases with L perp, we think that the quasar feedback is unimportant. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you. I have a last sample of what? Oh, the delta V90. I only have 11 pairs here. Yeah, because we require a shallow resolution at least. Yes. So um, the, the argument against there being uh, ejected feedback from quasars, I mean, you've got lots of gas with a high covering fraction, it's metal enriched, and there's high velocities. I remember that it used to be you know, five or seven years ago that uh, you know, Joe and I would be saying, hey, this is you know great evidence of quasar feedback. So what changed? Why is uh, what is great evidence of quasar feedback? You mean the, the, the fact the, that there's high velocities and metal enriched gas at large distances yeah. from the quasars? That used to feel like to, to him like the right thing. Why do you guys uh, argue against this now? I might have missed that. I'm sorry. Um, so here I ask a question: whether the gas is an outflow or a cold accretion? Because if you assume a gas is outflow, then there's a problem because of the extreme energetics it has to produce. And because we don't see a significant warm phase, but we, we find a significant cool phase, so the outflow scenario is not without problems. So, but the cold accretion scenario also has its problems. So um, until now, we still don't know. OK, let's thank 